Have you struggled with making and keeping friends? You're not the only one. Hi, I'm Essie. I'm an autistic and ADHD therapist. Today, I'm talking to you about the struggles of finding and keeping friends as somebody who is neurodivergent. All my life, I've struggled to find my crowd, to develop a group of friends who I can share common activities and interests with, people that I know who can consistently be there for me and who I can turn to in moments of difficulty. I've often found myself in my own head about this, questioning why I haven't held on to many friends and why having a friendship group is such a struggle for me. I've wondered if maybe my neurodivergence is the biggest obstacle, if I self-sabotage in terms of friendships, or I don't have the requisite skills to find, develop, and maintain friends. At some point, I heard the phrase, friends for a season, friends for a reason. And with a kind of fatalism that I'm not very proud of, I just accept that now. And I say, well, I guess somebody came into my life for a reason, and that reason's no longer valid, so they're leaving my life. Similarly, if it's a period of my life in which we've crossed paths, then if that period of my life lapses, I just tell myself I have to accept it and move forward and find new friends. Admittedly, that's easy when you're integrated into a workplace, in a school setting, social avenues where you're more likely to meet people. But in my experience, that can get more difficult as you get older because often we're not as integrated in those social networks. I've done a lot of reflecting about why it's so hard for us as neurodivergents to find and keep friends. And I have a couple of reasons that I'm going to share with you. Studies suggest that some neurodivergents prefer objects to people. There's a lot of discussion around this. I don't have the time today to get into it. But what I will say is that objects are consistent in their quality for the most part. People are not. Objects aren't going to turn on you and snap at you. And I find that I get a lot of comfort in, for example, books. I collect a lot of books, and those books are receptacles of memories or experiences, and they're objects of joy for me. I like to collect retro gaming consoles and new handhelds that are coming out because they embody for me my childhood and the joys of my childhood. I can have those, put them on a shelf, look at them, admire them, and they're there as a kind of substitute friendship group or even family. I know it's weird to kind of describe it like that, but that's how I see my collection of items. There are sources of comfort. They represent periods of my life or experiences. They're not intimidating. They don't ask questions. They don't make demands on me or my faculties. They're there to reassure me and provide solidity in my life. In some ways, I like to collect friends in the same way I do objects. They represent for me receptacles of shared experience. I like to keep them on a figurative shelf in my mind. They're sources of comfort. I know that they're there, but I don't always initiate or maintain communication with them, which I know is really important for maintaining friendships. So this preference for objects, in my case at least, translates to treating people sometimes like an object. And this connects to my next point, which is object permanence. As someone who is ADHD, my poor working memory often impedes my ability to remember those friends and to engage with them because, as is the case with many ADHDers, it's out of sight, out of mind. Unless I see that friend or I'm crossing paths with them in an organic way, I forget about them and I forget that I also have responsibilities as a friend to continue communicating with them and reach out and make them feel valued and create opportunities for us to do shared activities. It's not that I don't care about their feelings. It's not that they're not important to me, but I just fail to remember that they exist and therefore to engage with them. In the past, I've struggled with insecure attachment, and there are studies that substantiate high rates of insecure attachment among neurodivergent populations. I go a little bit into that in my book, Neurodivergent Game Plan. But in short, insecure attachment is passed down from your parents in their own behaviors and how they model attachment, and then you develop it as a result. I also know that minority stress as a neurodivergent can contribute to insecure attachment. It's not just our primary caregivers that are responsible for helping us develop attachment. It's other people in our orbit. Friends, peers, teachers, siblings, you name it. The way they interact with us can contribute to us developing insecure attachment. And this is more likely because we are targeted as a minority population. We're marginalized, we're bullied, we're excluded, we're mocked. Coming from that place of insecure attachment, I found I'm more likely to want to concentrate all my efforts on one or two friends, make them my confidant, share everything with them, my life story, my struggles. 
I sometimes trauma dump or anxiety dump on them. I seek comfort and reassurance and life advice from them. And it's a pretty heavy load for any one person to bear. And in my experience, a lot of neurodivergents do this. They concentrate all their efforts on one or two people. And that person eventually finds that they can't carry that burden anymore. And it can lead either to some boundary setting that can redefine that relationship and possibly end it, or it can lead to them just quitting the relationship because they don't want to have to deal with these demands. And this feeds into the neurodivergence belief that they are too much or not enough. What do they have to offer for a friend to even want to spend time with them in the first place? And even if they do spend time with that friend, maybe they'll be too much for that friend. Maybe their neurodivergent traits will overwhelm them. Maybe their neurodivergent needs and struggles will be too much for that person to have to tolerate. And a lot of neurodivergents withdraw from relationships for this reason, because they've been burnt a couple of times by people who conveyed that message to them or who rejected them because they were told they were too much or they didn't have enough to offer. This contributes to high rates of anxiety among neurodivergents. We're often scanning our social environments, being hypervigilant, Worry that rejection, criticism, judgment is going to come at us because we're different and because we don't meet neurotypical expectations. This behavior is an expression of structural ableism, and it's then internalized by the neurodivergent in the form of shame and self-criticism. When we look at high rates of complex PTSD among neurodivergents, we see that many neurodivergents develop a tyrannical inner critic who lashes them constantly with criticisms about their inadequacy, about their faults and mistakes. And this leads them to avoid relationships because they fear being in situations in which they will be externally criticized or they'll behave in a way or get feedback from the other person that triggers that tyrannical inner critic. CPTSD is all the more likely if we have a history of interpersonal victimization. And rates of, for example, bullying in school are much higher among neurodivergent populations. Coupled with people turning on us very suddenly in relationships or making fun of us behind our backs or tricking us and taking advantage of our inability to mind read or also just suddenly abandoning us without explanation makes us more prone to want to hide, run and avoid other people. One factor that makes relationships so difficult for neurodivergence is what I called failed trust falls. If you don't know what a trust fall is, it's a team building activity where you close your eyes or you're blindfolded and you have to fall and you expect your team members to catch you. And the idea, I guess, is that being caught should reassure you that you're part of a team, you're enmeshed in that group, and that these people will be there for you in times of difficulty, and that you can trust and rely on them. Often in social situations, we can feel blindfolded by our inability to understand how neurotypicals think and work, and we be our authentic selves, we are vulnerable, but when we fall, we don't get caught. And so we end up face planting, and we end up feeling humiliated and ashamed and regretful for having even trusted other people in the first place. One example of this is when we tell other people that we're neurodivergent and that we have certain struggles and the person acknowledges it and they offer reassurance and empathy. But when that challenge does come up in the relationship, for example, you say something socially inappropriate according to neurotypicals, that person automatically assumes the worst of you, doesn't give you the benefit of the doubt, doesn't ask any clarifying questions, and then vilifies you. That's an example of a failed trust fall. You are relying on them to give you that benefit of the doubt, to treat you with compassion and mercy, but instead they judge you just like everyone else. And it reaffirms this perception that people are always going to reject, judge, or abandon us. And each time this happens, we're more likely to want to withdraw and avoid other people. Another factor is how taxing social relationships can be. In my book, I discuss something called SES bandwidths, SES standing for sensory, executive, and social. The way I conceptualize this is that we have limited ability to tolerate sensory, executive, and social inputs or stimulation. And once we hit those limits, we get overloaded, and that can lead to shutdown, meltdown, or burnout. Because social interactions put demands on all three SES bandwidths. You're having to navigate sensory inputs, as well as executive functioning demands, particularly related to interacting with other people and being able to parse conversations and react the appropriate way and to continue engaging in that conversation and sustaining it. And then there's the social aspect, which is trying to read other people and what their expectations are of you and what a normative way to respond to is. All these things bundled together get overwhelming pretty quickly. The demands of day-to-day -day life alone are pretty draining on our SES bandwidths. And as a result, we often develop what I call SES debt. 
These demands have been so draining that we now have to spend an inordinate amount of time recovering from it and doing activities to regenerate our reserves. So these are just a couple of explanations as to why forming and sustaining relationships with others can be so difficult. If any of these resonate with you, I would love to hear from you in the comments. Alternatively, if I've missed something, I would also love to hear from you. This wasn't a comprehensive list, and I'm sure there are other factors that I've left out. Have you also struggled with forming friendships and relationships with other people? And if so, what do you think the biggest obstacles for you have been? If you found this video helpful, please subscribe to my channel and share it with anyone else you think would benefit from watching it. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in the next video. Bye for now.